Philippians 2. We're going to read the first 11 verses this evening. This is God's Word. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let's just come and pray before we come to his word again. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight and we just pause and we quieten our hearts. Lord, many of us have minds and hearts which are bloated with cares and concerns, with struggles and temptations, with, with questions that are unanswered, with things we are wrestling with. And this evening, Lord, we just bring them all before you right now. Lord, I don't know what's going on and in the hearts of these, your people, and, and the visitors that we have here tonight. Yet you do. And we just pray that, Lord, you would, you would calm our hearts and minds. That, Lord, you would give us hearts and minds ready to concentrate and hear your word. And we pray that you would speak. For we are ready to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said this morning, we started a series on the incarnation over Christmas. And we're going to be thinking about some of the implications, some of the things we learn about the incarnation and why it's so important. If you don't know what the incarnation is, children and visitors, incarnation means God coming down to the earth in flesh. So it's what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate God coming down in a human body, taking on human flesh, taking on human nature, and us receiving Jesus. And this morning we saw that our entire salvation rests on the reality of, of that of the incarnation, of the coming of Jesus, that if we had no incarnation, we would have no salvation. And this evening, I'd like us to consider what I've, what I've titled the incarnational standard. I was trying to come up with alliteration. It didn't work too well for the series, but it, we'll take it anyway. But it's the idea of Jesus being an example for us. Jesus comes not to save us, as we saw this morning, but he also comes and in his life gives us an example of how we are to follow God, what life looks like for a child of God. 
You see, because Jesus is the ultimate son, isn't he? Jesus is God's only precious son. Who has existed with the Father for all eternity. And Jesus comes down and shows us what a father-honoring life looks like. And so what I want to suggest to you tonight is that without the incarnation, we would not know how to walk in God's path. We would not know how to follow God. As you remember that the word tells us that by many and diverse ways, God spoke through prophets and visions and dreams and oracles, but he has spoken once and finally in his son. So Jesus, in his life and teaching, is the final consummation, the summarizing of everything that God had to say. And so when we come to Jesus, we see what a life lived for God looks like. And I'd like us to take just Philippians 2 here. It's a classic passage on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And I'd like us to look at how the incarnation fuels following God faithfully. But the reason that's important is because is can you imagine for a second what it would be like if, if God didn't come down in flesh and told you to imitate him? You know, I remember when I was a kid, there was a TV show called Hercules. I don't know if anyone remembers Hercules. And, and he was like half God and half human. So he wasn't fully human. He wasn't fully God. He was like a child of a God and a human that had babies. And don't, we don't ask how these things happen, but it happened apparently. And Hercules would go around and there'd be some problem. And he was basically a superhero. So he'd take on like eight people and he'd just smash them all really easy because he was half God. Now, if someone said to you, I want you to imitate Hercules, you'd be in a problem, wouldn't you? You'd be like, but I can't imitate Hercules because I'm not half God. I don't have the strength that Hercules has. Or if someone told you to imitate Sp Spider-Man or, or Superman or whoever, whatever hero you think is pretty cool, you'd be, it would be an undoable task, wouldn't it? It would be impossible for you to do because you don't have those powers. So if God had, had not come down and set an example as a human, We would only have the example of a God. And there'd be no way that we could ever think we could follow and imitate God. But God graciously, one part of the incarnation is that God graciously condescends, lowers himself down. And dwells on this earth in a way that we can look at Jesus and say, yes, I will follow you. And so that Jesus can say, take up your cross and follow me. Live like me. Die to yourself. Follow me. Follow in my footsteps. And so the first thing we see is, is the incarnational illustration we see the picture of jesus and we're going to consider the passage in reverse in three little chunks so the first thing is the is the illustration if you go down to verse six you know the interesting thing is this section from verse six to eleven if you cut out verse six to eleven this chapter would flow without a problem Paul didn't need to stick that in there. He could have just stopped at the end of verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he could have st slipped straight down to verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. But Paul deemed it 
so necessary. This, this command that he's given was so important that he wanted to give a piece of bracketed information to add weight to what he's saying, to add an example so they could see what it looks like to follow God in this way. And he gives us the example of Jesus Christ, the God-man. Verse 6. Have this mind among you, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul is going to give us a command, longing for the church to be like Jesus Christ. And so he takes his masterful paintbrush and he paints a beautiful picture of what Jesus Christ is like. You've got to remember, some of the people reading this letter never would have seen Jesus. They're in the exact same boat you are. Only ever read in the word about Jesus. Never got, never got to walk by him, hear him talk, see him do miracles. The people who read this letter, they, they didn't get to sit down at the table with Jesus. They didn't get to sit there and have Jesus wash their feet. They didn't see Jesus caring for the crowds. So Paul, using his pen, writes this to, to ground the upcoming command, to ground the command that he had already given them that we'll look at soon. And the first thing he grounds it in is the humility and service of Jesus Christ. Isn't it incredible? I mean, we're talking about God. We're not talking about, you know, a really willing servant, a really keen human. This is not just an amazing person who loves to be kind to other people. It's not another, another Mother Teresa. It's God who doesn't have to serve anyone. I mean, do you, do you recognize that? Do you recognize that God doesn't need to serve? God deserves to be served. God deserves to be honored. God deserves to be glorified. God deserves to sit upon the throne and have subjects. But God, out of his deep love, says, I will come and serve. So he comes down and he, he empties himself. He, he, des, he desires not to hold on to the equality of God. So what Paul's saying is, Jesus could have stayed in heaven and said, actually, I'd rather just stay here in heaven with the angels and with my Father and with the Spirit. I don't want to go down and live in the mire and the clay. But, but Paul says that Jesus didn't hold on to that, but he was willing to relinquish it, willing to let it go so that he could come and serve us. I mean, just think about what he let go to come down and take a towel and wrap it around his waist and bow down before Judas Iscariot and wash his feet. If you don't know who Judas Iscariot is, he's the guy who sells Jesus so Jesus dies. And there's Jesus. Bowl, cloth, washing his feet, serving him. 
and in action, imploring him to come to the one who can take away his sin. That's, that's the ultimate picture of what Jesus does, isn't it? He, he derobes himself of all of his privileges. He doesn't derobe himself of his godness. He derobes himself of his privileges in order to come and serve you and I. And he doesn't hold back, does he? Look at the verse. At verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. There was no more despicable way of dying than to die upon the cross. It was so despicable and shameful that a Roman was never allowed to be put on one. And Jesus said, God, the Father, I will be obedient to you for the sake of these people all the way to the cross. I will robe myself in their brokenness and sin and march to Golgotha. I will, and the mind starts to boggle at the reality of this, but I will put on a baby's diaper. I mean, can you just picture that for a second? God had his nappy changed by Mary. It's kind of outrageous. It's kind of scandalous, isn't it? The thought of God being so, so willing out of his love for you and I, that he would take on a baby's flesh. Like, he... I don't have words to describe what, what that looks like. But, um, but a sinful mother changing the nappy of our Savior. He was willing to bear all of it and be completely obedient, pursuing his Father's will to save a people, to save people like you and me. Because he loved you and he loves you and he goes on loving you because of the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But, but not only does he do this incredible service, he comes down and he walks through the service and because of his faithfulness, because of his work, because of his service, God takes him and exalts him. The work is finished and he restores him. And here, here we start to begin to see a picture unfolding from Paul. Paul is saying he didn't just come to serve, he came to serve in order to be exalted. And you remember the New Testament tells us that we are glorified in him. 1 Thessalonians. We are glorified in him. So Jesus comes and he serves and he's obedient and in his service and obedience, he serves us, but in his exaltation, he exalts us. And so the, the work that he is doing before the Father begins to get bigger and bigger. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, verse 9, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we get this, this, this painted picture. If you can just picture a, picture a big canvas and paints all over it. And Paul's painted us a picture of, a, of God coming and serving, being obedient, dying, being restored, being resurrected, 
being exalted. And Paul says, this picture is the foundation for why you live your life the way you live your life. If you want to know how you do this command here, this is how you follow this example of servitude and willingness and obedience with the goal of exaltation. You see, we don't live this life to this life's ends, do we? Jesus lived his life towards the exaltation at the end. And he says, you live your life towards the exaltation that comes at the return of Jesus Christ. But what is, what is this grounding? What is the, the great command that is being grounded in this? Have a look at verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul is calling the church, and he's calling us, firstly, to unity, to oneness. Verse 2, having the same mind, having the same love, having the same accord and the same mind. You know, it's the sense of complete unity. He's calling the Philippians. He's saying to them, you need to have a unified view, unified passions, unified love, unified thinking. Now, put that, put that command next to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. What do you see in Jesus? You remember Jesus teaching throughout John, I came to reveal the Father, the Father and I are one. You remember Philip's words when he speaks to Jesus and he says, if only you would show us the Father, then, then we would believe you. And Jesus says, do you not get it? To paraphrase, do you not get it? If you see me, you see the Father, for we are one. And so as we gaze into Jesus and we see his perfect unity with his Father and with the Spirit, and we hear Jesus in his humanness praying to God and saying, God, Father, I want the church, the people to be one united with you and you with them. And we read that and we look at this and we go, he's calling us to be just like Jesus. He's calling us to be children of God because this is what children of God are. They are one as God is one. God is united together in all of his thinking, all of his acting, all of his passions, all of his loves, all of his expressions. And we're to be like that. We're not meant to be focusing in a thousand different directions and pulling at one another and trying to drag the church in different ways. We're to have a united direction together and we follow Jesus' example in doing that. But not only is he pushing us towards unity as it's displayed in the Godhead, he's pushing us towards humility. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Is that verse not the picture of Jesus? Jesus did nothing from selfish ambition, did he? I mean, how could, you, how could you describe dying on the cross as selfish ambition? What about conceit? No, no conceit. 
counting others more significant. He died so that sinners might go free. It's like the definition of counting someone else more significant than yourself, isn't it? Remember, remember the words, it's one thing to die for a friend as someone you love, but what about dying for an enemy? Jesus died for myriads of enemies. And Paul says, be like Jesus. Follow the footsteps of your Savior. Be a child of God. But then he shows us charity in verse 4. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Remember the picture of Jesus standing beside the sea and he goes out and there's a great crowd of people that come to him and it says, and Jesus looked at them and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And what does he do? He ministers, he heals, he feeds, he cares, he loves. And he's still doing it today, isn't he? He's still coming to us and reaching out to us. He's still coming and looking to our interests and bringing about glorious things in our lives. Redeeming all the brokenness, redeeming all the suffering, redeeming all the struggles, redeeming every, all the silly mistakes we make, drawing us to the Father over and over and over again. And Paul says, go and do likewise. What does it mean for you? In, in the fellowship here, even, even just tonight, what does it mean for you to seek to dwell together in unity? What does it look like for you to count the person sitting next to you as more important than yourself. So that when you see a person serving, you don't think, great, I'm getting served. But your instant reaction is, why don't I go and serve the person? And what does it look like for us to display the charity of Christ Counting brothers and sisters more significant than yourself. You know, it's funny because all these different religions, they always say that Jesus is a good teacher. And he's far more than a good teacher. He's a glorious example, isn't he? And they used to have those, those bands on your wrists when I was, oh, in the 90s. And, and they had, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And people used to wear them everywhere, and there were T-shirts, and there were songs, and it was just everywhere. But there's, there's truth in that, isn't there? There's a sense of, how does Jesus act as, as an incarnational human, as God-man? I see him living his life. I see him reaching out to the tax collector, reaching out to the prostitute, welcoming the brokenhearted, sitting with the people who stink, caring for the broken, rebuking those that need rebuking. Defending the widow. Reaching out to enemies like us. And he sets us a glorious example in his life where we can look at and say, since I'm a child of God, that's how my life needs to look. Because I want to be just like my big brother. I want to follow the example that Jesus Christ has given me. And very briefly, we don't really have time, so very briefly, Paul gives us a wonderful inspiration to do this in verse 1. If there is any encouragement in Christ, and I just want you to, 
We'll just note this thing. I just want you to see the Trinity written all over this verse. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, which I would want to suggest that love is from the Father, any participation in the Spirit. You see how it's just this, this, this threefold stunning enforcement of why to do this, how to do this, what should motivate you to do it. Any encouragement in Christ, out of Christ's work, out of what Christ has won on the cross, out of what you've seen Christ doing, any comfort from the love that you have received from the Father from on high as He's lavished His love upon you, and any participation in the Spirit as you are filled with the Holy Spirit to full so that you can go out and serve Him. And then lastly, if you have any affection and sympathy. In other words, if you have care for the brothers and sisters of the church, live like this. You see, it's not, it's not motivated by getting God's love. You have God's love. It's not motivated by needing Christ in your life because you have encouragement in Christ. It's not motivated by trying to get more of the Spirit because you have participation with the Spirit. It's motivated by the fact that that is true. And so like a fire in your pants, the Trinity turns up and motivates you with zeal to follow Christ with all of your might. Are we doing it? Where do we turn for our example day in and day out? Is it the word of God as it reveals our blessed Savior? Or is it elsewhere? The incarnation is so much more, brothers and sisters, than a pretty nativity scene. Isn't it? It's a profound mystery of which we will never plumb the depths. And Lord willing, we might just get an inch deep by the end of this small little series. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ and his example he gives us. We thank you for the participation in the Spirit. We thank you for your love, Father. We thank you that in Christ we have encouragement. Lord, we pray that you would help us out of all of the work of the Trinity to follow you with all of our might, that we might be children of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.